It's a big one, my friends. The granddaddy of all the first cause arguments, and an absolute favourite among many apologists. This is the Kalam Cosmological Argument debunked. And this is the Kalam Cosmological Argument rebuttal. So, hello there YouTube, Bliss Creek Gaming here with another video. Um, you know, I saw this for the first time, and I thought it was meh. Um, and then I realized that he got more views, and I was still meh, until I started reading the comments, and I was like, meh? Question mark? So, and I saw Cosmic Skeptic's criticism, and I thought, that's nothing new. Uh, like, that I thought was horrible. I saw this one, and I was like, you know what, this guy actually does a better job. No, if, uh, you know, I don't want to offend people, especially these guys, because I actually like their content. I'm not going to lie. When, um, oh my god, I forgot his name. No, I think it's Steven. I think it's Steven. I'm so sorry, Steven, if it's not your name, Steven. But I think it's Steven and the other guy. I forgot his name. He's like a, he's like a bleach version of Harry Potter. I like him, though. I really do. We'll call him Cosmic Skeptic, because that's his YouTube name. So, Steven. Is it Steven Law? I can't remember. But Steven here. Hopefully it's Steven. If it's not Steven, I'm going to be super sad and embarrassed at the same time. You know what? Let me figure it out if it is Steven. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, it is Steven. I was right. It's not Stephen Law. It's Stephen Woodford. Mr. Woodford, I would like to apologize for misrepresenting your name. I'm sad about that. I really thought I had your name down. Because when I first saw you, your videos, I was like, he puts down the law, laws of logic, that is. So then I was like, Stephen Law. And then I found out your name was Stephen Woodford. And I was like, ah, that's still pretty cool, though. I'm not gonna lie. So <clears throat> let's, uh, let's go ahead and get into this. So this is the is it recording? Perfect. So this is the you know rebuttal video because there you know he does point out seven fallacies or flaw or six. Never mind. I'm sorry. Uh, just one short of perfection. Da da da. Get it? Because I'm a Christian. Seven perfect. Okay, whatever. So as I was saying. Um, I'm excited to do this video. I don't know about you guys. Hopefully you guys will find this entertaining, you know? Are you not entertained? As I was saying, you know, we're gonna get into this. Um, I really do like some of his content though, not gonna lie, uh, especially with his views on morality. Um, you know, I do think that they're kind of iffy, uh, but that's another topic entirely. I don't want to get into that. Today, we're just going to focus on the Kalam cosmological argument, you know, uh, especially purported and popularized by uh, William Lee Craig or Bill Craig, if you want to be more informal. So, um, you know what? Like Catholic bunnies, let's just jump straight into this. I like this intro. I don't have the software to do this intro. Also, I like rationality rules. I do think that... The history of cosmological arguments, or first... You no, know, for those who can't, you know, um, why does it have to be UK? Why can't it be American? Give me American. Whatever. It's got to be the proper one. All right, whatever. So, let's go ahead and continue. Um, yeah, I'm putting on subtitles for those who are hard of hearing, and uh, that is... Primarily because my father is hard of hearing and has a hard time hearing, so that's why I prefer subtitles, or at least that's why I try to have subtitles in a lot of my videos. So, apology for the digression, let's go ahead and continue on. Cause argument stretches back to Aristotle and beyond, where sure. they were used to prove the existence of gods such as Zeus. Mm -hmm. However, you're not helping, YouTube. There we go. See, cause and effect. My cause of not doing it was the effect that there was no subtitles. My heart saddens. They received considerable development during early Christianity, and then again between the 9th and 12th centuries by Islamic theologians, and it was during this time that the Kalam cosmological argument was first created. You know what? Is this even recording? It is. <laughs> That's what she said. Continuing on. The argument goes as follows. Whatever begins to exist has a cause. The universe began to exist. Therefore, the universe has a cause. Before we proceed to debunk this argument, it should be stated that William Lane Craig is predominantly responsible for restoring its popularity, 
1979, he comprised a defense of the Kalan cosmological argument in the form of two additional arguments. Now, while there are serious, like serious flaws with Craig's additional arguments, and while this video will indeed briefly cover some of these flaws, the main focus of this video is the original Kalam cosmological argument. And so sorry, Craig, you're not in the limelight this time. I have to take on your word salad of a joke at a later mm. date. Mm. So, to get straight mm. into the thick of it, the first point to be raised, in my opinion, is that even if we accept the Kalam cosmological argument in its entirety, all it would prove is that there was a cause of the universe, and that's it. It doesn't even suggest, let alone prove, that this cause was a being. And it certainly doesn't suggest that this cause was a being that is eternal, omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, omnibenevolent, personal and moral. That is one hell of a leap. Hence, even if accepted, the argument doesn't remotely support theism. That actually could have possibly been true, but not true. So, <coughs> so if we look at the Kalam Cosmological Argument, the third edition of Reasonable Faith by William Lake Craig, printed 2008, page 111 of the print edition. Though, of course, this is a PDF version of the print edition. Uh, you know, the cosmological, the Kalam Cosmological Argument. Uh, you know, whatever begins to exist has a cause, the universe began to exist, therefore the universe has a cause. But I would like to emphasize what he says here, conceptual analysis of what it means to have, to be a cause of the universe. <clears throat> Sorry. Conceptual analysis of what it means to be, a to be a cause of the universe then aims to establish some of the theologically insignificant properties of this being. I would like to emphasize this part. Now, if we go to the next part, okay, and here is page 152 of Reasonable Faith, and which it says nature of the first cause. And if we follow it through, because it is a value arg valid argument, uh, we'll, the only con contention that he and I have is whether it is sound or not. So let us read this. It therefore follows that the universe has an external cause. Conceptual analysis, intent enables us to recover a number of striking properties which must be possessed by such an ultra mundane being. Whereas the cause of space and time, this entity, uh, and I emphasize entity because it is a thing, must, be trans must transcend space and time, whether it's extraterrestrials or God, in this case, of the assumption here is a God or a God-like being, uh, it has to transcend space and time because Ma uh, all uh, matter, space, and time came to existence simultaneously. So, if the thing has to create space and time and matter, you know, obviously it can't be spatial. It can't be. Uh, it can't have time constraining it. Uh, sp can't, uh, space cannot constrain it. Time cannot constrain it. Nor materiality. And he explains this further, continuing on. And therefore, exist atemporally and non-spatially, as I said, at least without the universe. Um, and here. Or, alter or alternatively, the cause exists changelessly in an undifferentiated time in which temporal intervals cannot be distinguished. On this view, God existed literally before creation, but there was no moment, say, one hour or one million years before creation. And if you want further discussion of this alternative view, see time and energy. Okay, back. Uh, time and Eternity, Chapter 6 of William Craig's book. So continuing on. This transcendent cause must therefore be changeless and immaterial, since timelessness in change entails changelessness. Wow, I'm stumbling. And changelessness implies immateriality. Such a cause must be beginningless and uncaused, at least in the sense of lacking any antecedent causal conditions since there cannot be an infinite regress of causes. Occam's razor will shave away further causes. This entity must be unimaginably powerful since it created the universe without any material cause. And finally, most remarkably, such a transcendent cause is plausibly to be taken to be personal. Three reasons can be given for this conclusion. I'm not gonna give those three reasons, I'm just gonna give one. First, as Richard Swinburne points out, there are two types of causal explanations, scientific, 
explanations in terms of laws and initial conditions and personal explanations in terms of agents and their volitions. <clears throat> now, for example, if I come into the kitchen and find the kettle boiling, I ask Jan, why is the kettle boiling? She may answer, like any crew member from the Big Bang Theory, oh, well, the heat of the flame is being conducted by the copper bottom of the kettle to the water, increasing the kinetic energy of the water molecules such that they vibrate so violently that they break the surface tension of the water and they throw off in the form of steam. Was that satisfactory? Oh, yeah, sure. Can I have some? Sure. Or <laughs> she might say, ah, I just put on to make a cup of tea. Would you like some? <laughs> Why should? Be quite jolly. Did you get me some biscuits? Okay, I'm sorry. I did that only because he's British. Uh from the UK, whatever. Continuing on, <clears throat> the first provides a scientific explanation, the second a personal explanation. Each is a legit, perfectly legitimate form of explanation. Indeed, a, in certain contexts, it would be wholly inappropriate to give one rather than the other. Now, as a first state of the universe cannot have a scientific explanation, since um, all known physics breaks down at the singularity, or once we get to it, which leads to the singularity, um, I cannot have a scientific explanation since there is nothing before it and therefore cannot be accounted for in terms of laws operating on initial conditions. It can only be accounted for in terms of an agent and his volitions. A personal explanation. Uh, he's assuming here that a being has to willingly choose to create something. So, um... So here we're looking for a transcendent cause that's uh, all powerful in the sense that it has to have uh, power beyond our imagination to create a universe, um, matter, space, and time, and to have the laws to function in those, uh, e.g. law of the universal gravitation law. I can't even pronounce that. I'm so sorry, Newton. He's rolling in his grave. <laughs> you know, it has to be super intellectual. Uh, because it has to have monkeyed with physics in such a way to make uh, life possible, especially intelligent life. And it has to be atemporal in the sense that time cannot constrain it, therefore implying uh, eternality. Eternality? I think that's how you say it. Eternality? Okay, what do you know? Eternality. Uh, I guess I was right in the pronunciation. Okay, and continuing on. Uh, you know, it has to be eternal, um, having no beginning or end, uh, since space is, it's not constrained to space, since space is its creation, um, it is spaceless, so space is not a problem for it, and personal, only in the sense, only persons have uh, intelligence, and that intelligence comes from a mind, and of course, when you have a mind, you have a will, and... Um, Will, generally, is that faculty of the mind which selects, at the moment of decision, the strongest desire from among the various desires present. Will does not refer to any particular desire, but rather to the mechanism for choosing among one's desires. So, that's why proponents of the Kalam, cosmo Kalam, cosmo Kalam cosmological argument, like myself, say that this does support theism. Even if it doesn't support necessarily Christian theism, it does support theism in a sense. Um, as the famous Christopher Hitchens said, once you've gotten to the conclusion of the argument, that leads you to theism, but you still have to make it all the way to theism. But that's incorrect. As William Lenquig says, Deism is a type of theism. Theism is the broad worldview that God exists. Deism is a specific kind of theism that says God has not revealed himself directly in the world. And so when he says that um, it doesn't even suggest, let alone prove, that the cause was a being, and it certainly doesn't suggest that this cause was a being that is eternal, omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, omnipotent, personal, and moral, that's one hell of a leap. Hence, even if accepted, the argument doesn't remotely support, ugh, remotely support theism. That's false. It does support theism. However, even if it doesn't prove uh, a support 
for theism, not necessarily prove theism, uh, because, okay, let me rephrase this. If it does prove theism, then that's what we're going for. But if it doesn't, then at minimum, it proves the support for, no, never mind. It's supposed to support theism in its entirety. And if not, then certain, then just the general, you know, that it's timeless, spaceless, all-powerful, intelligent, and personal in that sense. So it, even if it doesn't prove, it does suggest it. Because it says here, he says here, it certainly doesn't suggest that this cause was eternal. Yes, we do, we do suggest it's eternal, omnipotent. Yes, we do suggest that because it's power beyond our imagination, omniscient. We would suggest it only for the fact that, hold on real quick. Oh wait, that's right, omniscient, because it would know more beyond our imagination, omnipresent, because it exists outside of space-time, omnibenevolent, but it doesn't show that, we don't suggest that in this argument whatsoever, personal, we do suggest, moral, that would be an implication from personal, but this argument does not necessarily argue for morality, so... This should be corrected. Hence, even if accepted, the argument does support theism. Now, going on to the second one. We'll let him talk. A second problem that arises, even if we accept the argument, is that while it would prove that the universe had a cause, it wouldn't prove that this cause itself was without a cause. Or in other words, it wouldn't prove that the first cause existed which for a first cause argument is pretty damn ridiculous. To be fair, the proponents of this argument do indeed offer additional arguments in the attempt to assert that the cause of the universe must be without a cause. But the point I'm trying to make here and now is that the Kalam cosmological argument by itself is pretty damn trivial. And hence, the proponents of this argument almost always employ additional arguments to reach their conclusions, including the likes of Craig. So far, we've just scratched the surface of this argument, and yet we've already demonstrated that even if it was valid, it wouldn't prove that a first cause existed, and it certainly wouldn't indicate that the cause of the universe was the Abrahamic God. So, that was also, as well, incorrect, because the argument in itself is valid, even if it's not sound, so anything which begins to exist has a cause for its existence. The universe began to exist, therefore the universe has a cause for its existence. And using mathematics, we can show that the that series of events does have a zero point in, in time. So for example, let's say that I had an infinite number of marbles in my possession and that I wanted to give you, the viewer, some. In fact, suppose I wanted to give you an infinite number of marbles. One way I could do that is to give you the entire pile of marbles. In that case, I would have zero marbles left myself. However, another way to do it would to be would to give you, the reader, all of the odd number marbles. Then I would still have an infinity left over for myself, and you would have an infinity as well. You would have just as many as I would. And in fact, each of us would have just as many as I originally had before we divided it into odd and even. Or another approach for me would to be give you all the marbles numbered four and higher. That way, you would have an infinity of marbles, but I would only have three marbles left. So what this illustration demonstrates is the notion of an actual infinite number of things leads to contra contradictory results. In the first... Uh, in the case of which I gave you the marbles, minus infinity minus infinity is zero. And in the second case, in which I gave you all the odd-numbered marbles, infinity minus infinity is affinity. And in the third case, which I gave you all the marbles numbered four and greater, infinity minus infinity is three. In each case, we have subtracted the identical number from the identical number, but we have come up with non-identical results.
For that reason, mathematicians are actually forbidden from doing subtraction and division in transfinite arithmetic because this would lead to contradictions. You see, the idea of an actually of an actual infinity is just conceptual. It, it exists only in our minds. Working within certain rules, mathematicians can deal with infinite quantities and infinite numbers in the conceptual realm. However, here is the point. It's not descriptive of what can happen in the real world. So if you substitute path, if you substitute marvels for past events, then you can see the, the absurdities that would result. So the universe, mathematically speaking, cannot have an infinite number of events in the past. It must have had a zero point in time or a beginning. And here he's saying it wouldn't prove that a first cause existed. It doesn't even suggest a first cause, but that's what the argument is arguing. That's what the proponents of the argument are arguing for using this. And he says, which for a first cause argument is pretty damn ridiculous, but I beg to differ. Because, <clears throat> let's see. I'm sorry, because George H. Smith in his book, Atheism, page 232, says that um, this argument, an argument like this is, quote, capable only of demonstrating the existence of a mysterious first cause in the distant past. It does not establish the present existence of the first cause, unquote. So even Mr. Smith acknowledges that this not only, that this not only suggests a first cause, but since it's valid, shows a first cause. And since I would argue that it's sound, proves a first cause. Now, that's the whole point, first cause. And then from that first cause, then you argue for theologically significant points. Nevertheless, let's continue on. However, in an effort not to bore you, let's now move on from the starter and get to the main mill. The logical flaws within the argument. One of the most critical flaws with this argument, and one that isn't always recognised, is that it commits a subtle but devastating equivocation fallacy. It does this because the argument switches between two different definitions of the universe throughout its premises in order to achieve its conclusion. During premise 2, the argument uses a scientific definition of the universe, that being all matter, space and time. But during premise 3, it uses a colloquial and or theological definition of the universe, that being, everything that exists, everything that has existed, and everything that will exist. The key difference here being, that when we say that the universe began to exist using the scientific definition of the universe, what we are saying is that all matter, and by extension all of space and time, began to exist in the way it does now. What we are not saying is that absolutely everything came into being from absolutely nothing. But when we say that the universe began to exist using the colloquial definition of the universe, we are indeed saying that absolutely everything came into being from absolutely nothing. And this brings us comfortably to another critical flaw with the Kalam cosmological argument. Another one, which I do disagree with, because as he said the scientific definition of the universe, which is all matter, space, and time. But during premise three, it uses a colloquial or a different meaning word, um, theological definition, okay, sure, uh, of the universe, which is everything that exists, everything that has existed, and everything that will exist. Now, he says, this key distinction here being that when we say the universe began to exist using the scientific definition of the universe, what we're saying here is that all matter, and by extension all of space and time, began to exist in the way it does now. What we're not saying is that absolutely everything came into being from absolutely nothing. But when we say that the universe began to exist using the colloquial definition of the universe, we are indeed saying that absolutely everything came into being from absolutely nothing. I don't think that's correct because those two definitions, if I rewind it, oh yeah, stopped his face like this. If I rewind it and put the two, uh, I think he had the two 
colloquial uh, and or theological there. definition of the universe. Definition of the Let's universe. See. What we are saying is... Okay. Mm. Oh, it doesn't have them together. From okay. absolutely so everything that exists, everything that has existed in time, and everything that will... Ex so everything that exists now, everything that has existed in the past, and everything that will exist in the future. Colloquial universe... When scientific universe, where are you? There we go. All, oh, it's up here. All matter, space, and time. Okay, now, emphasis on time as well. So that's all matter and space in the past, the present, and the future. So everything, so all matter and space and energy that existed in the past, that exists now, and that will exist. That's not a different universe. That's the same universe. Europe, the European Space Agency for Kids has to explain this. And it says, the universe is everything we can touch, feel, sense, measure, detect. It includes living things, planets, stars, galaxies, dust clouds, light, and even time. Before the birth of the universe, time, space, and matter did not exist. So, in reality, this quote-unquote colloquial universe is identical to the scientific universe. There is no difference between the two. Or even if there was, which I don't see, it is in the slightest degree, which is non-consequential to the argument of which its art of which its conclusion is being led to this is not a fallacy i don't know why he did that i mean i figured this out on the spot this was not even planned i didn't even realize this because i had no idea what to say until i started recording so if he can't do that and he's a trained philosopher or at least i hope he's trained is he well he probably knows more than me he's English, so he's proper, I guess, and I'm American, so I'm more slang, then why couldn't he figure this out if I can figure this out? Continuing on. Nope, oh, nope, that's not what I meant to press. Sorry. The universe began to exist. Using the colloquial definition of the universe, we are indeed saying that absolutely everything came into being from absolutely nothing. And this brings us comfortably to another critical flaw with the Kalam cosmological argument. No! It asserts... Also, before, we're not... So, proponents of the uh, Kalam cosmological... This argument, it, we're not saying... Uh, it's true. We're not saying that absolutely everything came into being from absolutely nothing. We're indeed saying that absolutely everything came into being from... Let's see if I can find that word... G O D. Okay, or you can say from a first cause from a first cause. That's what we're arguing for. Not from absolutely nothing. That's the that's the twentieth century atheistic perspective. Or modern if you consider certain atheists, which do not necessarily resemble all of the ideology. So continuing on that something can indeed come from nothing. A concept in philosophy known as creatio ex nihilio, creation out of nothing, when this has never been demonstrated to occur. What? What does he say? And, the, 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 comf, hold on. and this brings us comfortably to another critical flaw with the Kalam cosmological argument. It asserts that something can indeed come from nothing, a concept in philosophy known as creatio ex nihilo. Obviously, yeah, creation out of nothing, when this has never been demonstrated to occur. What are you talking about? How can we demonstrate creation out of nothing? When you go back in time, all of physics breaks down, even time itself, to a zero point. A zero point. And if I am to quote physicists John Barrow and Frank Tipler, they emphasize, quote, At this singularity, space and time came into existence. Literally nothing existed before the singularity, so if the universe originated at such a singularity, we would truly have a creation ex nihilo. Now, 
I don't say literally nothing in the sense that not even God was there, but I mean in the sense of the current material reality. And I mean all, all of material reality. So, how can we demonstrate the creation of the universe? Why are you even mentioning this is my question. I, okay, I can see what he says is going to come up. And he says, In fact, to the contrary, everything we know about cause and effect overwhelmingly and unanimously tells us that when a new thing is created, it is due to the rearrangement of energy and matter that already existed. That is, everything is the result of creatio ex materia. And in this sense, I agree entirely. Everything uh, that consists of the current material reality is the result of creatio ex materia after time equals zero, which is the singularity. After the laws of physics come into play, after the singularity, then yes, creation out of material is what we can observe empirically. Now, let me show you a obviously philosophically sound philosopher that even had to teach the best of us about this. For the sake of appearances. No, thank you. Yes, of course. Who has time? Who has time? But then if we do not ever take time, how can we ever have time? Chateau Aubryon, 1959. Magnificent wine. I love French wine. Becca loves the French language. I have sampled every language. French is my favorite, fantastic language, especially to curse with. Do you know why you are here? We are looking for the keymaker. Oh, yes, it is true. The keymaker, of course. But this is not a reason, this is not a why. The keymaker himself is very nature as a means, it is not an end. And so. To look for him is to be looking for a means to do what? You know the answer to that question. But do you? You think you do, but you do not. You are here because you were sent here. You were told to come here and then you obeyed. <laughs> it is, of course, the way of all things. You see, there is only one constant. One universal, it is the only real Causality. Action, reaction, cause, and effect. Everything begins with choice. No, wrong. Choice is an illusion created between those with power and those without. Look there at that woman. My God, just look at her. Affecting everyone around her, so... Obvious, so bourgeois, so boring. But wait. What, you see, I have sent her a dessert. A very special dessert. I wrote it myself. It starts so simply. Each line of the program creating a new effect. Just like poetry. First, a rush, heat, the heart flutters. You can see it now, yes? She does not understand why. Is it the wine? No. What is it then? What is the reason? And soon it does not matter. Soon the why and the reason are gone. And all that matters is the feeling. This is the nature of the universe. We struggle against it, we fight to deny it, but it is, of course, pretends it is a lie. Beneath our poised appearance, the truth is we are completely out of control. Causality. 
There is no escape from it. We are forever slaves to it. Our only hope, our only peace is to understand it, to understand the why. Why is what separates us from them, you from me. Why is the only real source of power? Without it, you are powerless. And this is how you come to me, without why, without power. Another link in the chain. And yes, as I said, it is true what he says. In fact, to the contrary, everything we know about cause and effect overwhelmingly and unanimously tells us that when a new thing is created in material reality, or this one, it is due to the rearrangement of energy and matter that already existed. In this material reality, that is, everything is the result of creatio ex materia. After the singularity and once natural laws were formed, yes. Creation out of material. The truth is that we have no evidence whatsoever to suggest that the universe, as defined by science, was created from absolutely nothing. You're right. That's absurd. Even David Hume said, I have never said such an absurd statement that something can come from nothing. He's right. Something cannot come from nothing. We're not saying that. We're saying that the first cause is God, the God of the Bible, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So let's continue on. And hence, the extraordinary claim that something can come from nothing requires extraordinary evidence. Um, that's also not true. Uh, you made some, uh, some claims, uh, extraordinary claims, which seem to me require extraordinary evidence, particularly about whether Jesus died and was then resurrected again. You provided very ordinary evidence that that may be true on a historical basis, that, um, Morality uh, is God-given in some way, whereas, in fact, there are very plausible arguments about uh, the biological basis of, uh, <clears throat> of morality. And I, I just think that you didn't really provide enough, uh, enough serious evidence in those kind of more interesting areas about what God may or may not be up to. Okay, well, evidence is, or I mean rather interests are person relative. I myself am terribly interested in contemporary cosmology, both with respect to the origin of the universe and the fine tuning of the universe for life. I am, I am captivated by the universe and its beauty, its wonder, its origin, its end. So I find those very interesting, whether you do or not. But with respect to the God involved in human history, this claim, this slogan, extraordinary events require extraordinary evidence, that sounds so right, doesn't it? It sounds so commonsensical, but in fact it's demonstrably false. Uh, probability theorists from the time of Condorcet to John Stuart Mill worked on the problem of what kind of evidence would it take to establish a highly improbable event. And what they found was you can't just consider um, the probability of that event relative to our sort of general background knowledge of the world. So as to say, well, an extraordinary event requires extraordinary evidence. You also have to consider what is the probability that the hypothesis in question is false given the evidence that we have. And if that probability is sufficiently low, if given the evidence that we have, the probability is low that the hypothesis is false, that can balance out any intrinsic improbability in the event being very extraordinary or, or highly unusual with respect to our general background evidence. So this claim, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence, is actually a false assertion. And I would say that in the case of the empty tomb, the origin of the Christian faith, the appearances of Jesus, these are not in any case extraordinary events. Those are non-miraculous events that can be established by ordinary secular historians. What would be miraculous would be when you come to the step, what's the best explanation of those? That's where the, the extraordinary part would come in. And, and uh, as I say, I don't think you need extraordinary evidence for that. But yes, let's continue on. And yet the best response the proponents of this argument have offered so far is the assertion that absolutely everything began to exist at the Big Bang which again, simply isn't what the evidence suggests. Okay, 
will, if that is the case, please then explain that to, or actually I would prefer you to tell that to Friedman Lematra, also William Lane Craig, or actually not Craig because he can be a, he's really good at rhetoric, I wouldn't even want to go against him, but Lema Friedman, Lematra, Einstein, Stephen Hawking, um, Newton himself even, all of them believed in the existence of the universe, or at least they believed in a, you know, a singularity, let me rephrase this, a beginning, or a time, uh, a time at which before that initial point in time, which we now call a singularity, did not, that nothing existed in either time itself before the initial creation of time. So, tell that to Newton. Continue on. Yet another defeat and flaw that the proponents of this argument commit, but not a flaw that the argument itself commits, is a special pleading fallacy. As already stated, the Kalam cosmological argument by itself only asserts that the universe had a cause. But the proponents of this argument go a step further. They assert that the cause of the universe didn't begin to exist, and therefore it didn't have a cause, without adequately justifying why this cause is an exception. In, in general, these proponents argue that, because cause and effect cannot occur without matter, space and time, and because matter, space and time began to exist as a result of the Big Bang, then whatever came before the Big Bang could not have had a cause. But to state it for a last time, the claim that matter, space, and time began to exist at the Big Bang is not substantiated. Bro. Bro. What? Bro, what are you talking about, man? I mean, does he not know that Einstein developed his general theory of relativity in 1915? I mean, did he not know in the 1920s, you know, you have, uh, what were they, Russian? Yeah, Russian mathematicians, you know. Um, no, it was a Russian mathematician, Alexander Friedman, and the Swedish, Belgium astronomer, George Lementary, were able to develop models based on Einstein's theory. They predicted the universe was expanding, and of course, if you went back in time, you'd hit a zero point. And, you know, Fred Hoyle, the famous astronomer, you know, mocked it, calling it the Big Bang, and guess what? The name stuck. And, you know, 1929, Edwin Hubble discovering the redshift. Then in the 40s, George Gamow predicted that if the Big Bang really happened, then background temperature of the universe should be a few degrees above absolute zero. And sure enough, 1965, two scientists accidentally discovered the universe's background radiation, and it was only about 3.7 degrees above absolute zero. There's no way, there's no explanation for this apart from the fact that is a vestige of early and a very dense state of the universe, which was predicted by the Big Bang model. According to the friedman lamatre model, as time proceeds, the distance, distances separating the galaxies become greater. It's important to appreciate that as a general relatively based theory, the model does not describe the expansion of the material content of the universe in a pre-existing empty space, but rather the expansion of space itself. The galaxies are conceived to be at rest but with, res with respect to space, but to recede progressively from one another as space itself expands or stretches, just as buttons glued to the surface of a balloon will recede from one another as the balloon inflates. So, the standard Big Bang model as the friedman lamatra model came to be called, thus describes a universe which is not eternal in the past, which had to come into a being at a finite time ago. Moreover, this deserves underscoring. The origin it posits is an absolute origin out of nothing, for not only all matter and energy, but space and time themselves come into being at the initial cosmological singularity. Now I would like to emphasize, this is the model in itself. The model says that there was nothing before the initial cosmic singularity. The argument is concluding that before this, during this, and after this, the whole screen is God. And he looks, and he's, he exists independently outside of the universe. So, but, model, 
is not talking about God. So the model says, as physicist John Barrow and Frank Templer emphasize, quote, at the singularity, space and time came into existence, literally nothing, and lit emphasis on literally nothing existed before the singularity. So if the universe originated as such a singularity, which we can prove mathematically, and we've even showed even more evidence in the early 2000s, we would truly have a creation ex nihilo. Thus, we may graphically represent space-time as a cone. On such a model, the universe originates ex nihilo in the sense that at the initial singularity, it is true that there is no earlier space-time point, or it is false that something existed prior to the singularity that is material. Now, such a conclusion is profoundly disturbing for anyone who ponders it. For the question cannot be suppressed, why did the universe come into being? Sir Arthur Eddington, contemplatingly, contemplating the beginning of the universe, opined that the expansion of the universe was so preposterous and credible that, quote, I, almost, I feel almost at an indignation that anyone should believe in it except myself, unquote. He finally felt forced to conclude, quote, the beginning seems to present inserpable difficulties unless we agree to look on it as frankly supernatural, unquote. The, pro the problem of the origin of the universe, in the words of one astrophysical team, thus, quote, involves a certain metaphysical aspect which may be either appealing or revolting, unquote. Okay, that's what I have to say about that. The Big Bang is substantiated. Okay, let's continue. To quote Sean Carroll, a cosmologist who in my opinion is remarkably articulate on this subject, the correct thing to say about the Big Bang is not that there was no time before it, but rather that our current understanding of the laws of physics give out at that moment in time. This is true. The correct thing to say about the Big Bang, if you want to be more correct or semantically proper, is not that there was no time before it, but rather that our current understanding of the laws of physics gives out at that moment in time. Because before that, there is no time logically. So you can say our current understanding of the laws of physics give out at that moment in time. Thus, the correct thing to say about the Big Bang is, th is skipping, that there was no time before it. <gasps> Mind blow. Thank you, Atomic3136, for posting that on YouTube for me to put on. So, continuing on. And this leads us to the last flaw I'm going to point out in this video. And it's another flaw that isn't committed by the Kalam cosmological argument itself, but it is very frequently committed by the proponents of this argument. Beneath all the additional arguments and word salads, the proponents of this argument are essentially making an argument from ignorance. What it all really comes down to is the claim that since no scientific explanation can provide a causal account of the origin of the universe, the cause must be a very specific god. A god that, wouldn't you know, coincidentally is the one that the proponent believes in. That's right, it all comes down to the extremely satisfying, we don't know, therefore god. Like I say in most of my debunk videos, there are many more flaws with the Kalam cosmological argument. <sighs> All right, looks like the last one. Oh, wait, we didn't even get to the special pleading. Hmm. Let's see, proponents go a step further. They assert that the cause of the universe didn't begin to exist and therefore didn't have a cause without adequately justifying. What? Without adequately justifying this cause is an exception. Okay, I'm not going to deal with this too much, only because that is directly tied to doesn't support theism, which he fails to, to support the statement. That this argument doesn't support theism. Go back, check this out, and you'll understand that. Where are you? That it adequate, adequately justifies why this cause is an exception. You understand? You understand? Yeah. Okay. So let me also just say another thing that Craig also says. 
um, because a lot of people say, you know, if, you know, everything has a cause, then the, f then, you know, the first cause is a thing, so it must have a cause in itself. Therefore, who made God? You know, if God made everything, who made God? Or if God created everything, what created God? So to say this is the first cause, as that to say that this first cause has always existed is to deny, how do I put it, the, the necessity of God. So that question in and of itself, who made God, just misses the point. So obviously, they're not dealing with the first premise of the Kalam cosmological argument, which is not that everything has a cause, but everything that begins to exist has a cause. Now, I don't know any... Um, reputable philosopher, says Craig, who would say everything has a cause. So they're simply not dealing with the correct formulation of the cosmological argument. And this is not special pleading in the case of God. After all, historically speaking, atheists have long maintained that the universe does not need a cause because it's eternal. How can they, how can they as an ideology with the past history of that, possibly maintain that the universe can be eternal and uncaused, yet God cannot be timeless and uncaused, because certain atheists currently have are stating that, and previously in the 20th century have stated that, and historically as an ideology has said that. So, yeah, let's just let's just continue from here. Oh, that's right, the argument from ignorance beneath all the additional arguments and word salads. I actually like this word. The proponents of the arguments are essentially making an argument from ignorance. What it really comes down to is a claim that since no scientific explanation can provide a causal account of the origin of the universe, the cause must be a very specific God. A God that, wouldn't you know, coincidentally is the one that the proponent believes in. What? <laughs> I thought this guy was a free thinker. So shouldn't he think free? So first off, Let's just read what he wrote, because I have a problem with that. What it all really comes down to is the claim that since no scientific explanation can provide a causal account of of the origin of the universe, the cause must be obviously a god. I have a thing to say about that. And that is something that I've already said. You know, there are two types of explanations, scientific and personal. Scientific explanations explain a phenomenon in terms of certain initial conditions and natural laws which explain how those national conditions evolve to produce the phenomenon under consideration. By contrast, personal explanations explain things by means of an agent and that agent's volition of will. So, if scientific explanations explain a phenomenon in terms of certain initial conditions and natural laws, how then, no, what, let me can actually, which explain how those initial conditions evolve to produce the phenomenon under consideration, how do we consider the initial conditions of which there are no natural laws? You see where I'm getting here? So it goes back to the example of the kettle, you know, why is, you know, why is the water boiling? You know, oh, because the heat is, is moving the atoms, which is breaking the surface of the water in the form of vapor, aka steam, you know, okay, that's all, you know, that's all based on natural laws, because we can understand the initial conditions. And, but how can we understand the initial conditions of the beginning of the universe if there are no natural causes? I mean, natural causes, sorry, if there are no natural laws, they all break down. So you guys understand where I'm coming from here? Like this is already quite a long video, but do you understand where I'm coming from? That's true. What it all really comes down to is the claim, since no scientific explanation can provide a causal account of the origin of the universe, which it cannot, because that's somewhat of a conundrum, in a sense, almost an oxymoron of a sentence, the cause must be a very specific God. A God that, wouldn't you know, coincidentally is the God that the proponent believes in. Yes and no. If you want to argue for a God in general, or the one, 
no, we're not talking about the Matrix, something of Platonus, the one, then yes, you know, if you take, take a world religions class, you know, Hinduism believes in the one God, which is the God that creates all other gods and angels, etc. You know, then you have um, the Abrahamic religions. You have Judaism, the one God, the Father. Then you have Christianity, the one God, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Three beings. Uh, no, I'm sorry. One being, three different persons. Then you have, you know, from Trinity, you go to Tawid. Tawid or Tawi, something like that. For Allah, you know, there is only one God. His name is Allah. Muhammad is the messenger, etc. Right? Then you go to other religions, you know, Native Americans, for example, the Great Spirit that created everything. You know, a lot of people, a lot of different religions, a lot of history, uh, the vast majority of history testifies that the vast majority of humanity has a sensus div divinus, as John Calvin said, that we can all naturally send to God. That's why there are so many religions. Obviously, Confucianism, perhaps, and Buddhism would be an exception. However, because those are more atheistic religions, so to speak, but that's another topic in and of itself. So this in itself would be from arguing to a god, which is the one. He is the one. So yes. It's not an argument from ignorance. You know, it's not of the God of the gaps. I don't know, therefore God. Because you can turn the tables, it's a double-edged sword. You know, I don't know how electricity works. Therefore, God makes electricity. You can say the same thing about evolution. I don't know how the origin of life came to be. But evolution did it. Or it came about via evolutionary pro the evolutionary process. You see what I mean? So, let's go ahead and finish this video. And there are countless more flaws that are committed by the proponents of this argument. But to recap just the few we've risen here, the Kalan cosmological argument is trivial and or useless because, even if accepted, it doesn't support theism. It does. And... Even if accepted, it doesn't suggest that a first cause exists. Existed. Actually, yes. It and does. the argument does is flawed. Suggest it proves it commits an equivocation fallacy. No, either you are ignorant, you haven't done your research, and therefore you're ignorant, or you're a liar. That means you know what it is, and you're misrepresenting. That means you're drawing a straw man. It makes you a liar. I don't know which one of the two you are. That's for, in my own personal view, because it looks like you are earnest, I don't think you're a liar. I just simply think you're ignorant, which therefore means you just need to be educated. And it asserts that something can be created from nothing. Of course, if you are all powerful, a claim that isn't scientifically supported. Oh, that's funny. How can you scientifically support that of which is above science? That's like saying, how do you scientifically prove the supernatural using natural laws? That's, that's dumb. It really is. It's like saying, how do I prove what's outside my house if everything I detect is only inside or is the house? Just because you don't see it, or detect it, doesn't mean it's not there. And the proponents of the Kalam cosmological argument also frequently commit a special pleading fallacy. Which... I'm not even going to deal with that. I'm just seriously... It's not special pleading. I don't know why people keep saying this. It's seriously misrepresentation of true philo Christian, you know, true philosophers who are arguing for Christian theism really is because we do justify it. You know, we create an exception to a rule by substantiating slash justifying why that case deserves exemption. It's like contingent versus necessary, okay? 
authority and an argument from ignorance. The Kalam. Ah, let's go back to that real quick. See what I mean? The assertion that a proposition is true because it hasn't been proven false. God created the universe is true because it hasn't been proven false. Argument from ignorance. Origin of life came about in the primordial soup. The, you know, life, the origin of life occurred in the primordial soup. And that's true because it hasn't been proven to be false. Example of argument from ignorance. Ta-da. The Kalam cosmological argument is either a sound argument that is trivial and relatively useless. Why does he say it like that? Like, for some reason, it's a sound argument that's trivial, trivial, and relatively useless. Like, it's trivial, sure, but it's not useless. Or, it's a grotesquely flawed argument that requires additional flawed arguments to reach a monotheistic conclusion. No. I think your counter-arguments are grotesquely f uh, how did you put it? They're grotesquely flawed argument that requires additional flawed arguments to reach a monotheist. Okay, yeah, so I think what you're doing here is grotesquely flawed that requires other people to come help you out. It's, oh my god, I didn't even realize his face I was looking down. Yeah, it, do, it does reach its conclusion. You got a problem, deal with it like a philosopher, do your research. Stick conclusion. Anyhow, as always, thank you kindly for the view, and I'll You're leave welcome. you with this overwhelmingly powerful argument to consider. Whatever channel begins to exist has subscribers. This channel began to exist. Therefore, this channel has subscribers. I just screwed with the first premise. I started a channel, I had no subscribers. So, valid, not sound. Break my heart. And it loves them dearly. All 293 of you. <laughs> Thanks, guys. You know what? I do like this guy. Do you know why? Because he's very, he's very calm about it. As ignorant as he is, I love this guy. Big heart. It. Big heart. Okay. But I think perhaps the reason... It's a big one, my friends. The granddaddy of all the first cause arguments, and an absolute favourite among many apologists. This is the Kalam cosmological. We're gonna go back. It's here. a big because hold on. On oh, my friends, we're gonna go with this. He's got a, he's got a good smile. I like the Jesus hair, and I got the same type of facial hair, so I like him even more so already. But I think the reason he may be ignorant. Probably because he's in the UK, and I'm an American, so obviously my superior, my obviously superior intellect of being an American outweighs him being an Englishman, so that's what I have to say about that. And you know why? I'll tell you why that's the case, in the form of less than 10 seconds. <laughs> America, America, America. Nevertheless, you guys, thank you so much for watching. I'm so sorry this went over an hour. It was only supposed to be like half an hour or a little over that, even if, but yeah. I don't know why I got so deep into it. it Should have been less, but. I do what I can, and I really try. I thank you all. I love all of you guys, including this beautiful, same facial hair as me guy, even if he's English. <laughs> That's a joke. You know, don't be offended, please. Uh, I still like you as a philosopher, mostly. Um, I love every one of you. You know, even if I don't like you, I still love you as a human being. You know, if you get shot, I'll try to save you. You know, because of the love I have for you as a human being everyone see every single one of you and i hope that you have a good week and a good rest of your day peace be with you